Welcome to episode 372 of the Cyber Law Podcast, brought to you by Steptoe and Johnson. We're lawyers talking about technology, privacy, security, and government. Disclaimer, the views expressed here are not, do not reflect uh, the opinions of the firm or its clients. As you can hear, this is not Stuart Baker. This is Alan Cohn, co-chair of Steptoe's blockchain and cryptocurrency practice. So that means that yet again, blockchain takes over the Cyber Law Podcast. For this episode, the Blockchain and Crypto Asset Edition. Uh, we won't have an interview today, but instead we'll have a round table discussion among our group to talk about what we see coming in the crypto asset regulatory space. But first, joining me for the news roundup and then the round table discussion today is Lizzie Baird, former Deputy Director of the Securities and Exchange Commission's Division of Trading and Markets and new Steptoe partner. Welcome, Lizzie. Matt Culkin, Steptoe partner and former director of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission's Division of Swap Dealer and Intermediary Oversight. Matt, thanks. And Evan Abrams, a Steptoe associate in our International Trade and Regulatory Compliance Practice Group, where he focuses on anti-money laundering, economic sanctions, uh, CFIUS, and export control issues, including with respect to, to crypto assets. Evan, how are you? Doing well. Thanks, Alan. Good. Good. Alan Cohn, Steptoe Partner, and the host of today's program. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do a bit of a regulatory summary and up for the first half of 2021 since our last blockchain takes over the podcast. So first, we're going to start over at the Treasury Department and with the, with the, with the agencies enforcing anti-money laundering and sanctions compliance requirements. So Evan... First and foremost, we had a notice of proposed rulemaking right at the end of 2020 that kind of fell over into 2021, almost became a, a last minute rulemaking of the last administration, but was extended and then closed. So can you tell us a little bit about what that rulemaking was? Sure. Uh, yeah, as you noted, this came out when there was kind of a flurry of last minute rulemakings at the end of the Trump administration. This one generated quite a bit of pushback from industry for reasons we can get into. And uh, so there's been some, there was an extension uh, of the time period to comment. And now uh, the proposed rule, the comment period is closed, waiting on a final rule at some point. I in terms of the substance, it relates to what FinCEN is calling unhosted wallets. Uh, others in the industry will call it self-hosted wallets or, or something else. But essentially- And as we go through, Evan, of course, since, uh, since some of these acronyms are a little different for our readers, uh, make sure you tell the folks, like, tell the folks what FinCEN is. Yeah, absolutely. So FinCEN is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is an uh, agency within the Treasury Department that has primary responsibility administering the anti-money laundering regulations that apply to different types of financial institutions in the U.S., including many companies who are active in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. All right, perfect. So what is this self-hosted wallet rule trying to get at? Yeah, so this would uh, have kind of two main requirements. One is a record-keeping requirement for cryptocurrency exchanges and other businesses that are regulated by FinCEN that deal with cryptocurrency. So a, a record keeping requirement for transactions that involve self-hosted or unhosted wallets over 3,000 and then a actual reporting requirement where you need to affirmatively send a report into FinCEN for that same category of transactions over 10,000. And uh, self-hosted or unhosted just briefly are wallets that are typically held by an individual, maybe on their phone or their computer. They're not held at, for example, another cryptocurrency exchange or another provider that's providing a, a hosted software wallet for. And so, and so, usually, and for the last several years, FinCEN has applied, basically given guidance, is applying its general rules to cryptocurrency exchanges. But this is a little different. Right? These are not requirements that other FinCEN regulated entities have to, fo have to follow in this way. Yeah, that's right. So this is one of the first blockchain specific rulemakings that we've seen from FinCEN. And to some degree, it mimics a similar requirement for cash transactions where there is a requirement to file what's called a currency transaction report for certain cash transactions over 10,000. But this rule has a number of differences and is specific to dealings with unhosted or self-hosted wallets. So, and so, so this fits as kind of one of two 
rulemakings, FinCEN rulemakings, towards the end of 2020. Uh, the other one was aimed at what you were talking about, cryptocurrency exchanges and other what are considered financial institutions in this space and reporting requirements that they have with respect to transmission of information. So what was that rulemaking all about? Yes, yeah, so that rulemaking relates to something called the travel rule, which has been on the books for a long time in terms of a regulatory requirement that applies to money services businesses and other types of regulated financial institutions. And essentially requires financial institutions to obtain certain information about the beneficiary and the originator of payments and to pass that information on to other entities the payments chain. So if you think about something like SWIFT or Fedwire that's set up to do that, FinCEN has taken the position for a number of years that the travel rule applied to, to digital assets, but there was some ambiguity in the rule in terms of if it applied, how it applied. It was contested by a good chunk of the industry. And so the rule that came out toward the end of last year would, or proposed rule, I should say, would clarify the application of the travel rule to dealings in what FinCEN calls convertible virtual currency. It would also lower the threshold for certain transactions, certain international transactions from 3,000 down to 250. Got it. Okay. And Treasury had actually gone out into the international community and, and tried to dri drive greater adherence to this travel rule through uh, the Financial Action Task Force, right? Yes, that's right. So a lot of this is stemming from the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, which is the international standard setting body for anti-money laundering. And they put out what are technically recommendations for nation states, but in practice are really followed by almost every jurisdiction out there to, to varying degrees. But by and large, uh, nation states will try to gear their AML regimes to meet the FATF recommendations. And okay, so one, sorry, go ahead, finish. Uh, so one of the things that, that FATF did recently was to update the recommendations to say that uh, countries should apply the travel rule to digital assets. And so in part, that's what's driving the rulemaking that I was just talking about. There's also uh, similar rulemakings or procedures going on in jurisdictions around the world that are in various stages as countries figure out how they're going to implement uh, a regime in their own jurisdiction. So where do we sit on the travel rule, proposed rule, and the self-hosted wallet? Yeah, so both of them uh, have... There's been a proposed rule that's been issued. There's been a comment period. Both of them generated quite a bit uh, of comments from industry. The comment period is now closed. So FinCEN is reviewing the comments that have been submitted. And presumably at some point in the coming months, we'll issue final rules for both of those rulemakers, whether those will be similar to what we saw in the proposed rule or there'll be substantial changes, I think remains to be seen. But that's kind of where we are procedurally right now. Got it. So looking towards the end of the year, the federal fiscal year or the calendar year, we can ex anticipate seeing potentially Treasury's final thoughts on these issues, which they kind of need to reach because they've got to get on to the next issues, which we'll talk about in the trends around issues like decentralized finance and decentralized applications and exchanges. But before we go there, let's just talk briefly about some of the OFAC enforcement actions, the Office of Foreign Asset Control enforcement actions regarding sanctions compliance that came out in the space. Yeah, so we saw two enforcement actions against blockchain companies. I think one was at the end of last year and one was early this year. Those were the first enforcement actions by OFAC against blockchain companies. OFAC has been active in the space for a number of years. They put out some FAQs. They have added wallet addresses to that are, that are connected with sanctioned persons. They've identified those wallet addresses and they've taken a number of other measures. But this was the first time there's been an enforcement action that was brought against a blockchain company, and there were two in quick succession. Both of them generally involved uh, companies in the U.S. that individuals on their platforms that were located in certain comprehensively sanctioned jurisdictions, Syria, Cuba, etc. All right. So, and what do we take from those? I mean, what's the kind of upshot? Yeah, I think uh, there's certainly an increased focus uh, by OFAC on digital assets and their potential use by 
either persons who are subject to sanctions in their individual capacity or entities who are specifically targeted or persons who are located in sanctioned jurisdictions. And there's a lot of guidance in both of the enforcement actions about what OFAC expects companies in the space to be doing in terms of sanctions compliance. And I won't get into all of that now, but uh, it is certainly worth a read for companies who are in this space and are wondering about OFAC's expectations and how they approach uh, potential enforcement actions to read through those because there are some good kind of lessons learned and tidbits in terms of what OFAC is expecting companies in this space to be. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So good summary of what the what FinCEN and OFAC over at the Treasury Department are doing. Let's leave the Treasury Department right now and move over to the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Matt, can maybe you start with just a primer on CFTC jurisdiction in the crypto asset space? Sure, Alan. Thanks. So as the name implies, it's the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, not the Commodities Trading Commission. And that's that, that's sort of the biggest misnomer is that the CFTC regulates everything from soybeans to cattle to crypto. But in fact, what, what they really regulate are the derivatives of those products. So the instruments that farmers or oil companies or airlines use to hedge crop prices or jet fuel prices, it's the it's either the futures contract or post Dodd-Frank Act, the, the swaps contracts that are being traded to help mitigate commercial risk in the primary sort of spot market. So that's the universe that we're starting. And so how does that then apply down into crypto assets? Well, so, so the CFTC for almost a decade now has followed the sort of the mandate that, that crypto or virtual currencies, if they're not securities, and, and the prior chairman of the CFTC made clear that sort of the first question was deference to the SEC about is it a security. But if it's a commodity, then the CFTC will impose its longstanding regulatory regime with respect to the trading of the derivatives contracts. So for example, while I was at the CFTC, two futures exchanges brought cash settled Bitcoin futures contracts that were traded on what are called designated contract markets. It means exchange. They were traded on the exchange and the trades were intermediated by what is called a futures commission merchant, just sort of the futures analog to a broker dealer. But, but all that activity went through registered entities in a regulated manner. Since then, we've also seen the introduction of a physically settled, so a Bitcoin settled futures contract as well. And, and so that's largely where the CFTC has spent its time on the regulatory front, it's reviewing the products and regulating the activity. I will say that the CFTC also has some underlying jurisdiction into the, the spot markets, but it's focused squarely on fraud and manipulation. So what is this, what's the spot market and how does that differ from the futures market? Sure. So, so the spot market is where the actual transacting of either currencies or cattle or Bitcoin is happening. So when you buy or sell the actual, in this case, commodity, that is a spot transaction. But if there's fraud in the spot trade, whether it's the price of poultry or the price of Bitcoin, that affects the integrity of the derivatives market. And so Congress has given the CFTC statutory authority to police for that for those reasons. And so we, there was a case a couple of years ago where a cryptocurrency exchange had to enter into a settlement with the CFTC concerning some of its exchange practices. And this hinged on whether the product they were selling or enabling trading was actually delivered to the user. What does that mean and why is it important in this space? Sure. So I'll try and do this without getting into parentheticals and statutory references. But the, the CFTC has the authority to also regulate retail currency. So think trading dollars against yen or euro, and also the retail trading of precious metals and other commodities. So gold, silver, palladium. And, but there's an exception. And the exception is that if the participants receive actual delivery are the magic words of the item, then it's outside the scope of the CFTC's jurisdiction. So for example, if you're at the airport, and you're exchanging $100 for 100 euro, you're receiving your 100 euro on the spot. 
And so that is not subject to commodity futures trading. There's also no leverage, which is an, an important distinction. And so that's where the line is drawn. Got it. Got it. Okay. So that makes sense. So we hear a lot about there is CFTC jurisdiction over crypto assets. However, the, the primary, the major cryptocurrency exchanges in the U.S., as opposed to the commodities the futures exchanges, are generally do not have to register with or don't register with the CFTC and don't become designated contract markets or, or other categories of registered entities because of this spot trading exception and the lack of, of margin trading in their, in their activities. That's right. Okay. And from the CFTC's perspective, part of its mission is customer protection. And so, but what we're seeing is, right, there's becoming a clear distinction between the U.S. and outside the U.S. in terms of the products that are permitted, the types of trading, particularly by, by retail regular people, where there are some products available outside the U.S. that U.S. persons cannot access. Right. Right. Uh, and that's because of the differences in the regulatory. That's right. Regimes. So one of the things we're going to talk about in just a few minutes is um, this, this new category of activity in the crypto asset space, which is usually referred to in a whole as DeFi, or decentralized finance. But it's notable that the CFTC is often one of the first U.S. regulators to kind of spot new and emerging issues in crypto assets and then make kind of public statements about how they fit into the CFTC's regulatory jurisdiction. So we'll talk about DeFi more broadly in a little bit, but it was notable one of the CFTC commissioners made a something of a, I don't want to say a definitive statement, but certainly staked out some ground with respect to DeFi. Perhaps, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, leaning a little bit for, further forward than some of the other U.S. regulators at this point. Yeah, that's right. And I'll touch on it and what, what he said specifically in just a second. But we've seen this now twice in recent years where post-financial crisis, post-adoption of the Dodd-Frank Act, the CFTC, which goes back 45 years, has a long history of regulating agriculture and commodity futures contracts. And so post-2010, there was a transition to a much heavier focus on interest rate swaps, credit default swaps, and other financial instruments. But the agency itself still tends to revert back to its roots, which, which poses obvious problems when you're moving to a, a financial product. And we're seeing the same thing happen here with virtual currencies. So Commissioner Dan Berkovitz, who's a Democrat, now in the majority, gave a speech a few weeks ago where he said, and I'm going to quote, not only do I think that unlicensed DeFi markets for derivatives instruments are a bad idea, I also do not see how they are legal under the Commodity Exchange Act. So that's pretty forward leaning. But his argument goes that futures contracts are registered products traded by regulated entities and by transitioning to a DeFi ecosystem where the markets, the platforms, and the participants are not registered, there's no carve out, he says, in the Commodity Exchange Act specific for either digital currencies or blockchains or smart contracts. So from his perspective, all of this activity needs to be regulated through the current rule set. Yeah, very interesting. And we'll talk about that in a little bit because it's interesting how the different regulatory regimes that we're talking about here how that all is going to converge on this decentralized finance space is something that I think a lot of people are waiting to see and a lot of people are waiting for more guidance from the U.S. regulators on this. All right, so let's leave the CFTC for the moment and let's hop over to the Securities and Exchange Commission. So Lizzie, kind of bring us up to date on the way that the SEC is thinking about crypto assets generally right now. Okay. So I'm going to take you back a little bit further than you guys have been going, just since it's my first podcast and I, I want to make sure I provide. And, so, we, and we want the audience to get the benefits of, of all of your thinking. So. <laughs> and I've gotten to watch it being there, which is really fascinating. So hopefully I can impart some interesting stories on that. So to understand how to comply with the securities laws, you first have to understand which regulatory framework your activity falls into. So if you're a digital asset as a security, it's going to be regulated by the SEC. Even digital assets issued through ICOs that call themselves tokens or coins may meet the definition of a security when applying the test for investment contract as articulated in 1946 by the Supreme Court case SEC versus Howey. 
I am not going back to 1946. Don't worry about that. So, as most people know, the Howey test is a facts and circumstances test that lays out four elements that would support a conclusion that an investment contract, therefore security, is present. They are an investment of money in a common enterprise in which the investor expects profits, and those profits are due to the entrepreneurial and managerial efforts of others. The test doesn't focus on what the asset is called, but rather on the economic reality of the situation. So the application of the Howey test digital assets was articulated for the first time by the SEC staff in July 2017 in a 21A report called the Dow Report. Dow stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. The Dow was created by Slocket with the objective of operating as a for-profit entity that would create and hold a corpus of assets through a sale of Dow tokens to investors, which assets would then be used to fund projects. The holders of the DAO tokens would be able to share in the earnings from these projects as a return on their investment in DAO tokens. In addition, DAO token holders could monetize their investments by reselling them on a number of web-based platforms that supported their secondary trading. In applying the Howey test to these assets, the staff concluded that the DAO token was a security and therefore was not exempt from registration under Section 5 of the Securities Act. Instruments that have the indicia of investment contracts, such as these tokens, must be offered and sold in compliance with the securities laws. The first enforcement action brought relating to the sale of digital asset securities was the Munchie case. Brought in December 2017, the staff in this case focused on the manner in which the tokens were sold to investors by the issuer, which the staff found to have been focused on the investor's potential profit. In June 2018, the director of the Division of Corporate Finance, Bill Hinman, gave a speech in which he emphasized that the manner of sale and the reasonable expectations of the purchasers would be significant in determining whether a digital asset was a security. He added the Gary Plastics case to the mix of securities analysis framework. In Gary Plastics, interest in pools of CDs, which themselves are not securities, were sold in shares where the issuer emphasized the ability to profit in secondary trading. Digital platforms created to sell such assets would lead the staff to conclude that the assets were securities because the value of the token would result from the efforts of others. In April 2019, the staff issued a framework for investment contract analysis of digital assets in order to assist interested parties with the application of a facts and circumstances analysis. They also issued a no-action letter to turnkey jet a licensed U.S. carrier and air taxi operator providing interstate air charter services, proposing to offer blockchain-backed digital assets in the form of tokenized jet cards. Consumers of air charter services would be able to use these tokens to purchase such services from turnkey third-party carriers and brokers of charter flights. The staff identified the following facts in support of their conclusion that the turnkey jet tokens were not securities. First, Turnkey Jet will not use any funds from token sales to develop its platform, network, or app, and each of these will be fully developed and operational at the time the tokens are sold. The tokens will be immediately usable for their intended functionality, which was purchasing air charter services. The Turnkey Jet will restrict transfers of tokens to Turnkey Jet wallets only, and not to wallets external from the platform. Turnkey Jet will sell tokens at a price of $1 per token for the life of the program, and each token will represent an obligation for Turnkey to supply air charter services with a value of $1 per token. If Turnkey offers to repurchase tokens, it will only do so at a discount to the face value. And the token is marketed in a manner that emphasizes the functionality and not the potential for an increase in the market value of the token. The staff's use of the Howey framework to support a determination of investment contract was largely supported by the courts in both the SEC versus Kick case in 2020 and the SEC versus the Slavsky in 2021, as the facts satisfied the elements of the expectation of profits based on the efforts of others. Overall, the SEC has justified a relatively ambiguous application of securities regulation as an effort to promote innovation. The idea was that as the blockchain projects mature, clearer lines can then be drawn. In the 2019 BlockVest case, the SEC eventually had prevailed after modifying its arguments into a modified framework, which acknowledged that not all blockchain-based digital assets would be treated as securities. In a case where there was an unaffiliated, dispersed community of network users, commonly known as a decentralized network, rather than an active participant that's responsible for essential tasks 
or responsibilities of the project, purchasers less likely to be viewed as relying on the efforts of others. So less likely to be an investment contract and therefore less likely to be a security. This idea that a decentralized network employing a distributed ledger technology as a fact pattern wherein blockchain-based tokens could function without being labeled as securities largely supported the staff's conclusion that Bitcoin wasn't a security. If you consider that one of the central purposes of the Securities Act is to protect investors by requiring issuers to make a large number of disclosures to help the investors understand what is being done with their money and therefore material to an investor's decision to buy, sell, or hold, you can see how there's nothing that Satoshi Nakamoto or whomever invented Bitcoin could disclose that would provide insights into the current or future value of Bitcoin. So here, the staff was able to conclude that the protections of the Securities Act were not necessary. That brings us up to date with the recent order in the coin schedule settlement that was issued just two weeks ago. On July 14th, settled charges were announced against Blotix, a company doing business as Coin Schedule. Coin Schedule was a website that publicized over 2,500 offerings of ICOs and digital assets. Coin Schedule compiled background information and news about the offerings and the issuer developers. It scored and ranked them based on different metrics and categories. The information on Coin Schedule's website was accessible by U.S. persons who made up a significant portion of the website's traffic. Digital token issuers paid Coin Schedule to profile their tokens and token offerings on its website. It offered issuers different tiered marketing packages where they could pay more money to get more publicity through placement in more prominent places on the website. There were additional services offered to the issuers for more money. The SEC charged coin schedule with violations of the anti-touting provisions of Section 17B of the Securities Act, which makes it unlawful for a person to promote a security without disclosing that they receive consideration for doing so or the amount of that consideration. This is the first time that the SEC has brought anti-touting charges against a website operator in the digital assets space. CoinSchedule claimed to perform some kind of due diligence that led to these rankings of these assets, or what it called a trust score. It also shared with the issuers ways in which they could increase their trust score, making the conclusions quite suspect. The failure to disclose the consideration received led the SEC to conclude that investors could be misled into thinking that this scoring was somehow independent of the amount of money that coin schedule was paid. What the SEC did not do in this order was to shed any light on the facts that led to, the, led to it to conclude that any or all of the 2,500 or so listings were indeed securities. In fact, Commissioner's Purse and Roisman dissented from the order, citing its failure to, to specify which digital assets of the 2,500 were indeed securities, and what facts led to that conclusion. So I have a few takeaways I want to share. First of all, it looks like the evolution of the Howey framework may have ended, unless, of course, a court forces the SEC to provide more clarity. Second, the coin schedule case seems to suggest that the SEC will be creative in its enforcement of the securities laws in order to go after any conduct that it thinks might be a violation, rather than accomplishing that through Note that Coin Schedule was already out of business at the time that this order was issued, and it settled the matter for about $200,000, which included disgorgement, interest, and a penalty combined. Oftentimes, entities that are in this position are eager to settle and don't put up much of a fight. This could have made it much easier for the staff to simply conclude the securities were involved and avoid specifically identifying them or articulating their cr- criteria. And finally, note that CoinSchedule was a UK company, but that a significant amount of its traffic came from the US. This is not the first time that the SEC has reached outside of its territorial jurisdiction to bring a case, for example, the SEC versus Telegram. But entities operating outside of the US should consider whether US persons can access their website, and if so, if their conduct could be reached by the US securities laws. Excellent. Well, thank you, Lizzie. That's really um, helpful. And I will tell our our audience, you usually have to pay thousands of dollars to attend a crypto, fancy crypto conference in Times Square in Miami in order to get that kind of insight from, from SEC officials and recently departed SEC officials. So thank you. So just in some summary, we have this Howey test, which is how you figure out whether something's an investment contract. Because a lot of times these tokens don't have, they're not They don't convey equity. They don't convey profits. They're just things. And the Howey test was all about, the Howey case was all about a company selling share, essentially kind of rows of trees in an orange orchard. And what Bill Hinman said, importantly, was the oranges that 
that were sold in the Howie case are just oranges. But it's what she wrapped them around, as you said, in Gary Plastics and others, how you package them, how you sell them, and how much you're putting into, you, the purchaser, are putting into gaining profit versus somebody else doing it for you. What was interesting, another piece, and we'll talk about it in a moment, was in Turnkey Jet, that, that, uh, that no action letter, what, that was one of the things that people in this space kind of looked to, although it's a different situation, and said, well, hmm, maybe the SEC doesn't, and it has a lot of trouble coins that, whose value fluctuates. But maybe they don't have as much problem with coins whose value does not. In Turnkey Jet it was a kind of a closed environment that the token traded in. But there are other things, other stable coins, which people may have heard of, that trade out on cryptocurrency trading platforms, but whose value is stable. And so far, the SEC has not really chosen to bring enforcement actions relating to these stable value coins, or these stable coins. So very interesting. So let me just touch on a couple of brief other things that are going on in the securities world, and then we'll, we will talk about some trends. First, Lizzie told you about names and cases that have gone on. Two of the big ones were the SEC versus Kick and the SEC versus Tele. These were not settlements. This was the SEC actually bringing token projects to federal court and either stopping them from proceeding or unwinding their activities. The SEC has now been in court for several months against a company called Ripple, one is one of the oldest of the crypto asset companies. And so there's some interesting things going on in the Ripple case beyond just the application of the Howey t- and beyond just uh, and beyond some of the issues that have come up in previous cases that involved initial coin offerings or ICOs where offerings of securities and sales of tokens have kind of gotten pushed together and, and considered an integrated offering. In this case, Ripple didn't have it on an ICO. It just began selling its own coins. And it did that back in, began formulating the plans for that back in 2012. Some interesting things in that case are the SEC, in its complaint, chose to make allegations concerning activities going all the way back to 2012. Unlike in other cases where it typically considered the Dow report, which Lizzie described, which came out in July of 2017, as having put out, put the industry on notice that crypto assets could be securities. So the Ripple case, unlike some the earlier litigation, is notable because it seems to be moving that deadline back and saying you cannot simply rely on predating the Dow report, but that all of your activities going back to the inception of your projects are, are fair game for scrutiny. Second thing is that the SEC and its complaint alleged that Ripple received advice of counsel warning Ripple that its products could be secure. That seemed pretty reasonable to the ca- the casual reader, since even today it's very difficult to determine whether a whether any particular token project would or would not be considered a security by the SEC under applicable law. The SEC has gone ahead in discovery and tried to obtain copies of the count of counsel's memo to piercing the attorney-client privilege. And this, uh, this has led to a significant discovery debate, which is still going on, about whether the SEC or another government agency can obtain the internal memos from counsel advising companies whether or not they think that a particular token project would violate the law or would, would implicate current regulations. Even in a space like this, where those laws and regulations, their, their application to crypto assets is still unclear. Then finally, while the SEC was seeking attorney-client privilege materials from Ripple, turned around and requested depositions from sitting SEC officials at the time. Again, another unprecedented move. And in a surprise ruling, the court actually has permitted Ripple to take a limited discovery, including depositions, of... SEC officials at the time, including then director of the Division of Corporation Finance, Bill Hinman, who Lizzie mentioned in her remarks. So this is a really interesting case, will be the next chapter in the SEC's proceedings against crypto asset cases, the companies, and we're all waiting to see how that will turn out. Second, there have been some interesting state regular actions against a company called BlockFi. BlockFi does is it offers interest-bearing cryptocurrency accounts, so you can deposit your Bitcoin and earn interest. In that way, it is conceptually similar to many decentralized finance applications that allow you to earn, in different ways, returns on your cryptocurrency without actually spending trading. 
state securities regulators in four states now have stepped in with cease and desist orders to tell BlockFi to stop marketing additional interest-bearing accounts. Why? Because they are securities. Now, now, interestingly, they didn't allege that it violated bank regulation rules. Each of the states in this instance has said that the selling of accounts where you deposit crypto, current crypto assets and do nothing more and earn interest on that is in fact a security in violation of securities and securities trading. This is an interesting harbinger for decentralized finance as well, since many decentralized finance applications offer the ability to earn or returns on, on invested or staked or otherwise locked crypto assets without necessarily requiring other action by, by users. So this, is a, this will be another interesting thing to play out and another front to remember that it's not just the federal securities regulators who have jurisdiction with respect to crypto assets. And then finally, crypto uh, assets, asset companies are not the only ones or the companies creating tokens are not the only ones that may find themselves the focus of enforcement actions. The trading platforms on which these assets trade may be as well. And so while most companies don't, uh, most exchange platforms don't disclose current investigations, we got a peek into uh, the world of, of crypto exchange platforms when internet financial company Circle, which is a well-known institution in the crypto asset space, filed to go public earlier this month, actually or last month, sorry, in July, via a $4.5 billion SPAC merger. And so so in Circle's disclosures, they noted that there were current enforcement actions against Polonia, a cryptocurrency exchange that Circle had previously purchased and has since disposed of. And in those disclosures, Circle noted that the SEC filed a complaint in December of 2017 against Poloniex relating to the trading of cryptocurrencies that may be characterized as securities. In addition, Circle also disclosed that it had received administrative subpoenas from OFAC relating to possible violations where Poloniex may have permitted persons from prohibited jurisdictions to trade on the platform. So this is, a, is an interesting insight into which U.S. regulators have been active in the exchange space and what we may be seeing either more of or more announcements in days to come or in uh, months, weeks and months to come. Okay, so that's kind of a, an overview of where things stand. Let's talk for a few minutes about what we think is coming. And I'd like just to focus on, on a couple areas. We'll talk, let's talk briefly about the SEC. Let's talk about decentralized finance. And if we have a minute, we'll talk about stable coins as well. So Lizzie, first, where, given all of this background, where do we see the SEC's enforcement focus turning to going forward? Well, good question. So I, I think there's an appetite for decentralized finance. The question is how to do it in compliance with the federal securities laws, because I don't think that the laws are going to change. And I think that the one thing that has been the, the bulwark there for all the staff in every division has been the securities laws. And But we have seen throughout the securities markets, we have seen evidence of people wanting to do different kinds of financings more direct, whether it's SPAC or direct listings. Anecdotally, when I first got to the SEC in 2018, we probably had six different entities come talk to us a week, and they were going to be doing some kind of securities trading, and it was going to be on the block. And we would ask them various questions, and we don't give advice, but we would ask them questions, which certainly suggested a direction to, to look at. And <laughs> it's a strong suggestion. Yes. Probably sometime the following year, you don't forget we had the government shut down, so nobody came in for a while. So then sometime in 2019, all of a sudden, we're not hearing anybody talk anymore about trading on the blockchain, trading securities on the blockchain, just to be clear. What we're now hearing about is everybody has transfer agents but there will be a courtesy copy to the blockchain. So that getting back to my first point about the, the federal securities laws, the customer protection rule 15C33 has been the last stand of customer protection for quite some time. And it is in part our adherence to that is quite frankly caused some would say to delay, but I would just say to be very careful in any statements about custody. Of, of digital asset securities, quite frankly, and many other things. So I think there's a place for this. I just think that it is going to have to be very clear that customers aren't giving up any safe. 
in order to enjoy whatever the the benefit is going to be of DeFi. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Matt, the CFTC and the SEC operate a lot in the same space. Thoughts on kind of this question and maybe kind of the CFTC implications of that as well? Well, something Lizzie just said is really interesting is that, you know, the securities laws have a framework for a qualified custodian, right? There's a defined term. There is an entity, a label that can be slapped on something. And it gives investors, advisors and others in the security space great comfort that they're putting their money, their securities, their crypto with a QC. The CFTC doesn't regulate custodians. It's not in the Commodity Exchange Act. And so there there are provisions about customer funds and customer property for trading futures where you can put it with a bank or a trust or a broker dealer, but there's not the standalone QC. And so something that, that I saw while I was at the CFTC overlapping with Lizzie at the SEC is that people would come in all the time and say, well, can we put the crypto here and call it a QC? Even though the, your law and your rules, right, coming from Congress, don't contemplate that. And that's a challenge. That's a real challenge. No, and it's interesting, and an interesting kind of transition to those rules have worked very well for, number one, investors, right? People who are not trying to use stocks or bonds or different types of physical commodities, but rather to invest in them, trade them, to be able to have to have access to them and to trade those products safely while someone else actually physically holds them. But of course, in the crypto asset space, it's not, a, it's not an exact fit. Number one, you have what's kind of referred to as kind of speculators and folks who are buying crypto assets for investments. But there's also the people who are, are users of crypto assets, people who may be buying these assets to use them. And those are not necessarily the same groups of people, number one. Number two, crypto assets developed in part because people didn't want to trade assets or hold assets via third parties. They wanted to do it directly. And so it raises this question of, is that a good fit, number one? And then number two, What's the implication of these even more decentralized platforms? Because, of course, traditional cryptocurrency exchanges are basically custodians. But decentralized exchanges replicate these functions using smart contracts without a centralized intermediary. Let me add to to Matt's point. Another thing that is central to securities laws is accountability and the ability to confirm that you actually hold the securities you do. And at least I didn't see, and maybe others in the staff have seen more at this point, but we weren't satisfied with if securities are traded on a blockchain in a decentralized way, we haven't seen a clear ability for either the firm's outside auditors or even inside compliance. So they've got to check every day to make sure that the securities that, that they say are there. And there's not yet a way, let's just say, that the staff has confidence in. And there's talk. People have come in, and in doing private blockchains, they've talked about having a regulatory node. And But I don't think we've gone as far as to really see it in operation. And that may be the direction that it's going, but it's got to be an ability for not only your inside folks to be able to confirm that those securities are there, but outside auditors to come in. And that's a big part. Again, it's custody, but it's customer protection. Matt, thoughts on that? Well, it just it, it made me sort of chuckle a little because we, we used to have folks come in to say they're going to do some sort of blockchain enabled transactions. But then once the customer onboards, they're going to handle everything through book entry. And so, right, but outwardly facing to, to the market and to customers, it's all about crypto and blockchain. But then when you kind of open the cupboard and look inside, there's a, there's a book entry ledger. We get a lot of that too. And it's just that the, the blockchain is really just window dressing. And I get that they want to use it in their marketing and they want it to look exciting and forward thinking. I, I, I don't know that it's there yet. I'm not saying it won't get there, but I don't know that it's there. What's interesting is with these decentralized finance platforms, of course, there are there is the ability to access liquidity pools. There is the ability to trade assets directly without the custodian or the intermediary intermediate exchange. 
but there isn't yet the, the kind of infrastructure around the entryways and exit ways to, to meet or to address some of the questions surrounding anti-money laundering and your customer and sanctions compliance in some cases. Evan, do you want to talk briefly about that and what, we, what, what, may, what we're starting to see the beginnings of, especially from some recent FATF activity? Sure. It's a good question because I think it's an area that regulators in the U.S. and around the world are focused on. And FinCEN has issued some guidance on defined decentralized exchanges, decentralized applications uh, in guidance it published in 2019. But I think industry has struggled a little bit in figuring out how to apply some of that guidance to their specific business models. And interestingly, in that guidance, FinCEN says that decentralized exchanges, it's a little bit unclear how broadly or narrowly it it understands that term, but that at least some decentralized exchanges are not uh, subject to regulation as money services businesses. But I think with the DeFi summer that we saw and the increased interest in DeFi, there is interest, as I said, in the U.S. and in and, and other countries in finding ways to extend regulatory regimes focused on anti-money laundering to DeFi projects. And so one of the things that's happened recently at FATF, which we talked about earlier, is proposed updates to its guidance with respect to virtual asset service providers, which is the term that FATF uses to describe entities in this space that uh, should be subject to national regulatory regimes. And one of the, the recommendations has been to extend that definition to cover decentralized exchanges and certain other types of decentralized finance projects. It's in a proposed stage at, at this point, but I think tracking that is going to be really interesting to see where FATF lands and then also where the national regulators land as they implement the updated FATF guidance. No, definitely interesting to see because whether it's on the securities or commodities regulation side or on the anti-money laundering economic sanctions side, it will take new guidance to really clearly understand how each of those regulatory regimes are supposed to or intended to apply or not apply to decentralized finance platforms, whether those are decentralized exchanges or other sites, types of decentralized applications. Well, I think that's all the time that we have for today. I think we could talk about these and other issues for uh, for much longer, but I do want to say thank you to Lizzie Baird, to Matt Culkin, and to Evan Abrams for joining us today. Don't forget to send your questions, comments, and feedback to cyberlawpodcast at steptoe.com. Rate the show, leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks also to Weissman Sound Design for our music. This has been episode 372 of the Cyberlaw Podcast, the Blockchain and Crypto Asset Edition, brought to you by Steptoe and Johnson.